Hello everyone, my name's Jack Fernan and this is Exploring Existence, the podcast that looks at the teachings and practices of the world's religions through the lens of personal experiences. Today on the podcast, I spoke with Richard Lang, who is headless, and, says Richard, so are you. Richard is a long-time adherent of the Headless Way, which is a practice that was developed in the modern context by Douglas Harding, a British architect who had an insight into his own nature and began sharing it with the world. The question that the Headless Way asks of people is, who are you? Or, to put it another way, what is it really like to be you? And the insight that Douglas Harding had, which makes people wake up to their experience, is that you are unable, without assistance, to see your own head. The concept of being headless has historical origins and is found in the mystic traditions of all the major religions, where the mystics have spoken of seeing through our existential scotoma. Now, Richard was an early follower of Douglas and helped him develop a number of the techniques and experiments that show people their headlessness. One of the more popular experiments is to point out at some things that you can see in your visual field. For example, now I'm pointing at a table and now I'm pointing at a computer. And then you turn your hand around and point your finger back towards your head. And in doing so, you realize that your finger is now not pointing at anything that you can see. In my conversation with Richard, we spoke about how he came to find his headlessness and his understanding of what it means to be headless. We spoke of the stages of human development and how as children we begin being headless, but then we develop identities of ourselves that are at odds with our true nature. Richard also talked me through Douglas's life and his involvement in the development of the ideas and experiments of the Headless Way. We then moved on to talk about the similarities and differences between the Headless Way and Zen Buddhism. Douglas Harding had initially thought that headlessness was an expression of the ideas found in Zen, as Zen also speaks of the great void at the centre of the self. But as you'll hear, Douglas came to see that headlessness was in fact a novel path. We finish up by running through an experiment that I would highly recommend you to follow along with and speaking about the simplicity and availability of the Headless Way. I've included a link in the description to the podcast of the Headless Way website, so feel free to check that out if you want any more information or if you want to get in touch with the Headless community. And so, everyone, thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the podcast. So, Richard, thank you very much for for joining me today on the on the podcast. You're welcome. Where Where are you at at the moment? I'm in London, in England. And and how are things there with the whole um, coronavirus situation? Uh, well, we are in lockdown, uh, of course, and so it's a a new way of living, and uh, as it is everywhere. So, uh, yes. Um, uh, I'm doing all right myself. Thank you very much. Right. And and what have you been doing to to occupy yourself in, in the quarantine? Oh, I'm continuing with projects uh, related to sharing, uh, seeing who you really are. Uh, so uh, as I would have been doing anyway, actually. So I'm just getting on with uh, projects of that nature. Yeah. Well, you can't let a virus get in the way. Well, you can, but I'm not going to let it. No. <laughs> I suppose I'm lucky. I, you know, I'm fortunate. I'm healthy, and I, I can do this. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, a lot of people aren't, obviously. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Well, we might start just having a little bit of a chat about yourself personally, and about your spiritual journey, and then we'll get into uh, the headless stuff and um, some of Douglas Harding's teachings a bit later. So do you want to just start by giving a bit of a outline and a background of, of your your own spiritual path? Yes, I could do a, a brief one. Um, well, I was born in England. I live in England and I uh, was brought up a Christian. And uh, then I uh, sort of moved on from that, I suppose, when I was about 15 because I was particularly interested in the mystical side of things and uh, I wasn't really finding what I was looking for within Christianity. I think it's there, but I wasn't finding it. So I started, this is the late 60s, the 1960s, so I started looking around at the other religions and I got interested in Hinduism and in Buddhism 
And then when I was 17, I was reading about Buddhism. I uh, found out about the London Buddhist Society. They were running a summer school, so I went when I was a teenager to find out what it was about. And it was rather confusing. I was young, I was shy, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. But Douglas Harding happened to be there. I'd never heard of him. And I went along to a little workshop he did one afternoon. And uh, he did the experiments and he showed me who I really was, this open space that we all are. And he just uh, directed my attention there, which is all you need to do. And it was what I was looking for. And Douglas always said that if you were interested in what he was doing, then you were very welcome to visit him. And so I did. And I, I uh, started going regularly. It was in the uh, southeast, well, in East Anglia, actually, of England. I went to university shortly after that nearby. So I used to go from university to his house a lot. I met a lot of people there, and everybody was seeing who they really were, was enjoying this headless perspective. It was very natural and a lot of fun and deep. And what was happening there was that uh, there was growing a, a seeing community, a community of people seeing who they really are. And I became part of that. So I've still got many, many friends from that time who are uh, uh, you know, very good friends because we share the seeing in common. But I suppose my own individual journey um, was that I got very interested in sharing this. I recognized how effective the experiments are and what a breakthrough they are. They do not ask you to believe anything. They do not ask you to join any kind of group. They just say, rely on your own direct experience, your own perception of what it is like to be you. It is just so simple. What is it like to be you? First person, singular, present tense. In contrast to what it's like for others, what you are for others. So this is the difference between what you look like at six feet and in the mirror and in cameras and what you are for yourself and to take that difference seriously and I think to recognize it lines up with, with what all the great mystics are talking about, that your true nature is, is incredible, it's boundless, it's timeless, everything is in it. And one only has, this is a breakthrough, the headless way is a breakthrough, it, it just says Trust your own experience. Be your own authority. Look for yourself, what it's like, where you are. You notice you can't see your head from your own point of view. You can see your nose coming out the nothingness. Uh, and if you touch where you think your head is, you just get sensations. You don't get a head. And uh, this contrasts, of course, with what you see in the mirror. And uh, there is your appearance at six feet or three feet. And here is your reality. And um, so I was really struck by these experiments. And there are many of them. And they're not just uh, visual. Uh, they uh, make use of all the senses. Plus, Douglas Harding did a huge amount of work on how it makes sense scientifically, how it makes sense in terms of development, the baby, the child, the adult, the seer. And uh, so I... I think at some level I just dedicated my life then to sharing this. I thought that is that is fantastic. Now, since then, I've explored other lots of other things. Uh, and uh, that has helped me put this in perspective, really, and uh, realize how special this way is. It's not for everyone, I'm, I suppose. Uh, not everyone is attracted to it. Although I have to say, I mean, it is everyone's experience of themselves. You can't see your head. And I think it, it can, uh, I'm just rabbiting on here. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, please go for it. Well, one of the things that's really helped me is to, uh, the understanding of how this fits into our understanding of how we develop personally. So the, it's a very, very simple thing, but profound. You know, I think... All the great ideas are profound, you know, relativity, evolution, the unconscious, 
Uh, well, here's another one. And um, in terms of personal development, the baby is first person. You're pre-language, so you're headless. You're at large. You're not in a box. And everyone recognizes that. It's a non-verbal, pre-verbal experience. But it's infectious. When you're around a baby, it's not playing the face game. It's not imagining what it looks like and trying to impress you. It's just headless and natural and authentic. Now, from day one, really, everyone around you, if, if you're the baby, starts reflecting back that you're a baby. And uh, through gesture, through language, through pointing at the mirror, and to begin with, it doesn't make much sense, but gradually you take it on board and you learn to look in the mirror as a child. You learn to look in the mirror and in imagination reach in and get that face and pull it out and flip it the other way around and make it bigger and imagine putting it on like a mask, you see. Well, you can't do that, but you've got to do that in imagination so you know what people are looking at and you can get begin to individuate and understand who you are as an individual in the world and, and be that. So by the time you're an adult, you look in the mirror and you say, that's me. In other words, you put that appearance on, not just your face, but your body and your name and your age and your job. And So here I am talking to you over there, Jack, and I have a, a pretty good idea of who I am as Richard in, in London. Uh, and uh, all of that, and uh, you're over there in Australia. So we have achieved the third stage, which is, in effect, being able to see ourselves as other seers. Because you can't see yourself from your own point of view, but there we are, out there, imagining what everyone is seeing, which is a good thing. Of course, it, it, too much of it, and you get self-conscious, and it becomes obsessive, and you get... Uh, and all, And there are plenty of things that a rather, um, uh, well, that one that one is in the mirror and the other see is mortal, you know. So there's, a, there's, there's things to think about that one, being that one. But you see, so th this means that I can talk to you uh, uh, and be well aware that I'm Richard and, and you're Jack uh, and I'm in England. You, and, but that, you see, is the third stage. The baby is headless, hasn't a clue about who you are. The child is learning to put that appearance on, that identity and take responsibility and join in the society, you see. The adult has done that. Now you know who you are. And you hardly, as an adult, question that. You say, of course I'm Richard. You know, of course I am. What? I'm, you, you're saying I'm space for the world? What? That's nonsense. I'm Richard. I look in the mirror, there I am. You see me? You see? So... That third stage is utterly uh, defined by I am what I look like at six feet. And is that sort of there quite quite made up of personal identity? Um, yes. And sort of, of yes, all of that. Yes, uh, which is great, you see. But the thing is that it's not the end of the story. Uh, and uh, the next stage, the fourth stage of the seer, seeing who you really are, is to re- uh, investigate what you are, take a fresh look at what you are from your own point of view. All that is really, the, the third stage is really what others see uh, and what you remember and what you see in the mirror and the camera and, and all of that. And the fourth stage is saying that's all good, you don't have to get rid of that, but just have a look at what it's like to be you from your point of view. So it really takes courage. Uh, you've got to sort of stand alone and say, all right, just for the moment, I'm going to put aside what you all say. I accept it's true from there. You see, this is the relativity thing. Relativity, you could say, is it can be applied here, that what anything you look at is depends on how far away you are from it. So I'm looking at a table, uh, but I should say, well, it's a table from here, because if I go up to it, it's fibers. And if I go closer, it's molecules, and then particles. So in other words, it's like an onion, it's got layers. And what I'm seeing is what it is at this range. And what it is at zero, at the center of its onion, I don't know, because I can't get there. But I'm at the center of myself, you see, and you say, well, you're richer. I say, well, that's what I look like at that range. And if you came up to me, I would be a patch of skin, and then I'd be cells and molecules. And I take that seriously. I really am like an onion. Now, what is at the center? 
No one can tell me, uh, but I can look. And the, the listener could actually point your finger back at where you're looking out of to direct your attention. I'm doing it now. It's a, you know embarrassing thing to do, I know, but I really suggest you do it. Yeah, yeah, and you, Jack, do, do it now, you see. Just point point back at your own face. Now, others see you pointing at a face. That's true. And from out there, and you can imagine that, but what do you actually see? Well, I see no face, no boundary, no colors or shapes, no movement. I'm pointing at what it's like to be me, my true nature, which is empty, you see. So that, how simple is that? Now, this changes everything, however, uh, because the first person is so utterly different from the third person. The third person is what you look like over there to others in the mirror. First person is what you are. And you can't get what you are wrong. You are it. You know. You might get what you look like wrong. How do you know you've got it right? But you can't get what you are wrong because you are it. Now, are you looking out of two little eyes or out of one great big window? Well, I'm looking out of this clear, boundless window. You've got to look, you see. But you can't see your face. Instead, you see the world. So, uh, well, uh, you, you know, I'm... I'm uh, uh, I'm going on a bit, but uh, this is just a fantastic discovery. And I recognized this when I was a teenager. And uh, I was just interested in that kind of thing. And this delivered the goods, really. And I got to know Douglas well, Douglas Harding. I read everything he'd written, you know, and traveled with him quite a bit and helped him with workshops and just got the feel of what it was about and... Uh, we, you know, be part. I became part of the process of making up the experiments. Just became friends with everyone. So I've really, my life, I have been in two societies in a way. One is the normal society, where everyone accepts that they are what they look like, but they don't know anything else. And this mini society within this larger society, this mini society of seers, who. Were, uh, were and are seeing who they really are uh, uh, without rejecting the, 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 the other one, you know. And so this is very, very supportive to have friends uh, that are seeing this and living from this and exploring it and sharing the difficulties as well as the joys of it, you know. Yeah, I think it, the fantastic thing about it is just the simplicity of it. Um, yes. And you don't really do anything special. You just need to bring a different awareness to your your visual field. Yes. And, but you were mentioning those, those meetings where you would go to Douglas's house and you'd sit around in groups. Um, in, when you were doing that in the early stages, what... What sort of things were you doing at, with with the people that were there? Uh, well, Douglas had a second house. It wasn't a very large one, but he uh, was an architect and he designed and had it built in the early 60s or mid 60s or something. So we used to meet there uh, uh, because his wife uh, over the road at his other house wasn't interested. So uh, there would always be people there and so it was a sort of partly it was a social, social thing, but we would. Uh, Douglas was very keen that uh, it was all about seeing. So you didn't go there just to social, socialize or have a nice weekend. It was in the country. You went there for for the purpose of seeing. So we would uh, often do experiments or, or things together, and we'd talk quite a lot, probably. Uh, about the experience and share our responses to it. If there were new people, we would, you know, people would take them, th we would go through the experiments and share it with new people. And Douglas made a toolkit of the experiments. Uh, in 1972, I, I and others helped him with that, you know, making it up and making the boxes, doing it all by hand. And this was very good because you were, operating from the space you know you're seeing your arms coming out the nothingness doing it so it was a meditation really so everything was an opportunity to be aware of who, who you were so uh, the thing about it is that you can't not get it i mean it's not you can't see your head instead you see the world 
this is one of the things that people they say oh i haven't got it and i say well can you see your head and they say no and do you see the world instead yes well that's it but i don't feel anything no you don't have to it's not feeling uh, and uh, it's not thinking it, it's a nonverbal thing you're going to think about it you're going to have a response to it but once you recognize that it's you've got it uh, you're looking out of it you are it but it's not dependent on how you respond you see this is a great thing because you're not going to be happy all the time and you're not going to be having a deep realization or if you have a deep realization you're not going to be able to keep it and the, the often uh, if people do a workshop which can be you know a day workshop or just a couple of hours it's sort of sustained awareness of your true nature and people can get quite high uh, some people can but then the next day they wake up and they don't feel high anymore and they think they've lost it uh, and uh, this is a learning experience uh, because uh, you haven't lost it you've lost the high and uh, gradually you you will come to realize that life continues to go up and down but the space you're looking out of doesn't uh, so it's very uh, kind of humble in a way the other thing is that one of the powerful insights that this immediately reveals is that when you're with others it is face to no face uh, now this is the difference between the outside and the inside because you recognize from the outside if you imagine so we're talking jack and uh, if we were in the same room and we were talking we could imagine a third person seeing us face to face right from another chair or something so that's uh, that's both of us going outside as it were and seeing our face to face nature now the first person point of view is face to no face and that isn't going outside 6 feet and looking at us which we understand and re recognize the value of but this is being at home with one's own point of view and so i have no face instead i have yours we call it trading faces i have your face you have mine uh, and in other words there's nothing here where i am to keep you out i am uh, you could say i'm built open for you i'm empty for you and you're empty for me and this is very very traditional namaste uh, the indian greeting is is really that you put your hands together the two are one you know i recognize the one in you it's the same in the one as the one in me well this input in very simple physical terms is i am looking out of open space not out of two eyes i'm looking out of this open space now uh, that has not got my name on it or address or nationality and you are given here in this awareness and i accept that you're in the same wonderful condition that over there you don't see jack's face you are looking out of open space there and right now you're full of rich's face you see so this is namaste but this is put in is not for uh, kind of just thinking about or saying to someone it's actually enjoying it yeah so then that is such uh, ongoing meditation isn't it when you ever with anyone you can notice it's face to no face uh, and you don't have to say anything or even think anything and it's really the the, the basis of love it, it is seeing that you are empty for the other person yeah you mentioned that sometimes people will do it and they don't have an amazing experience or a revelation that is life changing but obviously there's something to that visual experience that is at least sometimes profound and I, and I appreciate that it's uh, hard if not impossible to uh, explain some of these experiences in words but what are the type of experiences that that you've had or that the people that you've been in contact with when doing these experiments um, had well I, I say well the whole range you know from I'm not interested in that at all 
you know, so what? You know, well, well of course, I can't see my head. To my God, I, this is who I really am. I am the one in all beings. Everything is within me. I was never born, I'll never die. And everything in between. Uh, and probably I've had that whole range as well. Uh, I think that, uh, you see, the ex everyone gets the experience. But the experience isn't, I would say the experience isn't profound or shallow. It's just the experience, right? You can't see your head, you see the world. Now, why someone might value it and another might not, I think, I don't know what, why. Uh, that's mysterious. Uh, I mean, it might be conditioning, I suppose, but it, I think it's very. It, I think it's mysterious, and so I don't try and uh, guess who is going to value it and who isn't. I, I, I'm, I did. I suppose in the past I was usually wrong. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the person who you think is who is really interested in all these things is going to value this dismisses it as a trick, perhaps. You know. And the person who isn't interested in anything like this hasn't got that kind of expectation and just says, oh, my God, yes, I see what you mean. But um, I, I think that as you go on living from it, because obviously it's one thing to see it, but another to live from it. So uh, it is easy to share with the experiments. Uh, it's very easy to share. But then to live from it, uh, value it and live from it, uh, is a, that is another thing. And it's a lifelong project, I suppose. And it is, uh, demands attention. You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to live from it, to benefit from it, and to enjoy it. And how do you live from it? Well, you... you you start from wherever you're at and start attending and get into good habits about it, I suppose, you know. And you, you, do, you, you might start with, all right, each day, uh, at least once a day, I'm going to remember to notice I'm face to no face if I'm with people. Once a day, you know, and then the next week, Twice a day. <laughs> yeah, you've got the rest of your life, or ten times a day. You know? Or I'm going to notice my single eye, you know, this openness I, I'm looking out of. Uh, there's no dividing line. I'm going to just sit, sit on, uh, for a minute, once a day, and just notice the single eye without having to think or feel anything in particular. You see, or even point at it, as we were doing just a moment ago. Uh, and there are other experiments, you know, that uh, there's one where you point and turn round uh, and you notice the world moves and you're still. And this is actually, everyone knows this, you, you know, you're, you're driving along or you're in the car or in a train and the scenery is moving past. Right? It's just flowing. Well, that's your direct experience. Now, you can imagine yourself, you know, looking at yourself from somewhere out in the country and there you are in a car moving along and the country's still well that all right that's that point of view but the first person point of view is you're this open wide open space that's still and the scenery is moving you don't go anywhere you don't move an inch now this is relaxing it's fun and it's true so there you see all this is not the kind of spiritual practice where you have to go and sit somewhere on your own quietly and calm down and hope, hope, hope. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, you know, I remember someone told me recently, she was so glad, you know, she used to meditate. And when she meditated, she spent most of the time, you know, uh, hoping for it to end. <laughs> you know, because cause it was just like duty, you know. Whereas the seeing who you are is just in the, is is not. Uh, I mean, you know, that's. I, I'm sure that there's lots of good things. And I did a lot of meditation, you know, in my in my time. I, I I've explored that. But this is meditation. Uh, but it's meditation in this right now. I'm looking out of nothing, and my voice is coming out of nowhere. I don't know what it's going to say next. You see, and I close my eyes, and the world disappears, and I open my eyes, and it reappears. Now that is fun. You see, and uh, you see, our meetings at Douglas's house were a lot of fun. 
it, it, not everybody's being solemn. It's like a lot of fun because it is great fun. Uh, and uh, you could always, at the Buddhist society, some school, you could always tell where the headless people were because you just li listen for laughter. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, it's not, have you got it? You know, has he got it? How deeply has he got it? She got it? You know, they, do they need to improve it a bit more? You just say, no. You see, I, I, you know, I haven't even asked you, have you got it? Because you're looking at, you know, I mean, you can't see your head. How ridiculous to question <laughs> that, you see. So there's no hierarchy, yeah, right? Yeah. And your response to it is as valid as mine. I, I'm not telling you the truth. I'm just sharing my response to this experience that everyone has and is, you see. But, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm on the soapbox saying it's important. It's brilliant. It's fun. It works. It it enables you to live better, to be more creative, more loving. You know, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the, the laughing thing because I was trying. Um, there, there's there's one of the experiments, as as you would well know, is is looking in the mirror, and uh, I was trying That's trying it today, job. and I put my hands up to my ears, and I can see the, the the reflection and the hands on the ears in the reflection. But yes. for me personally, my hands have just disappeared. And yes. when that happened, I just started laughing. I know. It's very funny. Yeah. Just, the mirror. It, Douglas it, Harding used to say the mirror is one of the great teachers worth, you know, worth, worth all the books on spirituality uh, because it shows you where your face is. Uh, you see, and it, and it's out there. Your appearance is out there, not here. It it is. It doesn't let you off. We we, tr we muck about with the mirror, and we we imagine that face over here on above our shoulder somewhere. You see, but that's imagination. And the mirror is saying, really, the message in the mirror is, I've got your face. You know, you know, I've got it. You know, yeah. Uh, and you don't. And uh, the mirror, you see. Uh, as a baby and an infant, you don't look in the mirror and say, that's me. You say, oh, who's that little friend? But as you grow up, uh, you learn to imagine that appearance, which is what you look like at three feet, six feet. You learn to imagine it at center, where where it isn't. Now, everyone else sees it there, so that's why you do it. And so you can understand who they're talking to and you can take responsibility for that one. But uh, that we get we get uh, fooled by our own cleverness there, and, and uh, we believe our own PR. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, now the headless way is saying, "Well, just come to your senses. It's not a belief. Come to your senses and, and look and see uh, where your face is." And so the mirror. You know, when when you, you 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 used to look in the mirror and and say, "Oh, that's me." Now you can say, "Well, you still say, I still say that's me." But now I also say, "Well, I," but now I see on this side of the mirror is this wide open space, just absolutely free and clear and open and fresh. What a relief! You see, what a relief! And the one in the mirror is growing older, uh, uh, but the one this side of the mirror isn't. Uh, and that's so energizing and uh, uh, good news and refreshing and true. The bottom line of this is, is it true? You know, what's the truth about you? Not, not let's try another technique for feeling better, but what's the truth? And the truth turns out to be just fantastic. Is uh, who you, yeah, who you really are and who we all are. And it's not something that a few people can get after years of whatever, you know, uh, and everyone else has to look up to them. I'm being a bit uh, naughty. <laughs> but, but, it, it's, but it's the truth, isn't it? That's the problem when we uh, project on people that they've got it and we don't. And it's nonsense and it's uh, divisive and it's hierarchical. And it's just untrue. It's just untrue.
it it, it almost sounds the, the idea behind it almost sounds like a reworking of, of Descartes. Um, I think, therefore, I am, and you could change it and say, I see, therefore, I am. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it's very funny because Descartes, in his great book, uh, whatever it was, I mean, I've not read it. I, Douglas Harding pointed it at this out. Descartes starts this his investigation. You say, right, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. You said, I'm going to just state what is what I can be sure of. Right. And you know what the first thing he says that he can be sure of? He says, the, the, the first thing that I can be absolutely sure of is I have a head. <laughs> <laughs> now, you wonder where Descartes went wrong? <laughs> you know, you know there, I have a head, therefore my thoughts must be in my head, therefore I am separate from the world and my mind is separate from my body, you know. But when you see you've no head, you're, where are your thoughts? They're a part of your view out. They're out there in the world. They're not separate from, from the world. Uh, you, you have nothing here. Uh, that, you know, you're not contained. You, your mind isn't in a little box. It's coming out of this no mind. It's a very traditional Zen no mind, you know. Now, this is really practical psychologically to see that you're not uh, this kind of cloud of thought separate from the world, which you've somehow got to clear up. You see, there's no box here. So you're, you've got thoughts and feelings, but they're at large. There was a, a great Indian teacher called Ramana Maharshi, who's dead now. And, uh, you know, people say, well, what do I, how do I cure my terrible mind he said well find out where your mind is in 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 effect your mind isn't central your your no mind is central your your pure being is central and it is absolutely calm and peaceful and free in everyone so bring that into your awareness and operate from there it's great fun it's creative it, you're you're you open yourself to this resource that is freely there, always there, your true being. We've, we've sort of been name dropping Douglas Harding a little bit uh, throughout throughout the conversation. And he he did develop this, this novel technique. But do you want to just give us a, a quick outline of, of his story and how he sort of came to discover this, this novel way of, of seeing the world? Sure. He, he was born in the east of England in 1909, and he was born into a fundamentalist Christian sect. His father was very devoted. So he grew up as uh, in this Christian sect. But uh, when he was 21, he left. I mean, he'd been drifting away from it for some time, moving away from it. And But he, um, and he was training to be an architect, and he'd already written some short stories. He wanted to be a writer. But when he left, he didn't leave quietly, as most people, almost everybody would have done. Uh, and it wasn't a very big group, you know, but it was very strict. I mean, you were not allowed to practically talk to others outside the sect, you know, except he had to go to school. And you weren't allowed to read any books apart from the Brethren book, books and you weren't allowed to, you know, go to the cinema or the theatre or, you know, it was, it was a, a narrow way, but deep. I mean, his father was narrow, but he, his father uh, had a deep conviction that behind the world was love, God, that that, that was at the, the heart of things, even though it was a rather crazy uh, setup there. And... When Douglas left, when he was 21, he, he wrote a 10-page essay and read it out to them saying why he was leaving. I mean, he, he said, I, you're saying that you've got the only way and you're asking me to believe that you've got the only way because you say you have the only way. That no other justification for it. You can't show me the evidence for that. You're just saying you... you we are the way uh, accepted, and I won't. And he was, he, they didn't like him for that, and his father cut him off. I mean, it, it, that was 
uh, you know, he was the worst case they'd had. Now, uh, having this background uh, and also having a, a big dose of curiosity, he he started uh, in London. Uh, he was, uh, you know, training as an architect and then becoming an architect. He started asking the question, who am I? I uh, and uh, he was curious. What am I? What, I'm alive. What am I? Well, you know, and, and they didn't want to take on someone else's belief. So he, he started doing it through science and philosophy. And he very quickly realized he had layers like an onion. If you, if you went up to him, he was a society of cells. And if you went away... You know, from the individual, it became part of a, a society of humans and then part of life and part of the planet and part of solar system. So he mapped out a kind of mandala-like, onion-like map with a mystery at the center. What is at the center? And then he, he got married. He went to India to work as an architect there in 1937. The war broke out. And uh, his inquiry intensified. And then he, uh, he'd he been really trying to get to the center of himself from outside. right? You know, uh, from this distance I'm a man, from this distance I'm cells, from this distance I'm molecules, and then I'm almost nothing. But what's at the center? And uh, uh, one day he saw a picture self-portrait by Ernst Mark, the physicist. And it was a self-portrait drawn from the guy's own point of view. It's quite a famous picture where he's headless and a big nose coming out of nowhere. And Douglas saw that and realized that was what he was like from his point of view. So he no longer had to sort of try and peel away the last layer from outside. He was looking out of his center and he could see it was headless and open and spacious. So that was a big breakthrough. And he'd already been writing and working on this for some years. But that really uh, kind of adjusted everything because he now could see what he was. But there was an awful lot to work out, how that applied, how that worked out in terms of science. And so uh, that was in 1943, perhaps, and it, uh, eventually, you know, coming back to England and not going back to architecture, but working on this book, working out of this realization in terms of science and a new view of himself in the world, really. And that book was published in 1952. And uh, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote an introduction. And after that, he went back into architecture, still continued writing. So he, he saw he was headless in 1943, but it wasn't until, until 1964, 20 years later, that he managed to share it with his secretary at work. And he, he thought he was going to live his whole, whole life without sharing it. Uh, but he shared it with her, and then the next year with a couple more people, and then gradually... You know, I met him six years later, and and there were quite a group uh, of people who were enjoying this, uh, which was just a very thrilling thing for him, uh, and unexpected, and inspiring, and brings a whole new level of uh, of experience into it, really. And he continued writing, and was always looking for ways of sharing this in new ways. He did a model, he did the toolkit, he did books, he. He developed the experiments in the late 60s and early 70s. He then traveled a lot and uh, always responding, uh, anyone interested. And, uh, and in the 90s, he got married again uh, to Catherine, and she really shared seeing, so they became a duo in a way in the 90s. He died in 2007, but the last 20, you know, 15 years of his life, he, he was sharing with going around sharing with Catherine, his wife, who I just spoke to this morning. She's in her 80s in France. She's French. So uh, it was turned out, you know, extremely productive life, a lot of books, uh, a very charming man, really, but very one-pointed. And he had a, 
approach the whole question of who am I in a very Western modern way and really stuck to it and not been diverted. And he he found it. And then he he was the person to present it in a modern way. The hierarchy of heaven and earth and the science of the first person and all his books, uh, people should read. They are... Uh, they are fantastic books uh, showing how this is true and what the implications and applications are of it. Yeah. You mentioned that there was a, a 20 year gap between him having that first real experience and then him sharing it yeah. with someone. What was it that was holding him back? Well, society. <laughs> society <laughs> was not recognizing it. I mean, nothing was holding him back. <clears throat> Although, in 1961, he wrote on having no head, and he was he was sort of asked to do it. And um, you see, the first book and the first writings were very deep philosophy. I mean, great stuff, fantastic, but not popular books. So uh, it was a very limited audience in a way. Uh, and he hadn't got the experiments. And this was the 1950s and just come out the war. And, uh, you know, and then he had to get back into architecture. And uh, the thing about On Having No Head uh, is that it's a popular book. And he could write in a popular way. Uh, and it became a classic. And I think that uh, that w demonstrates in a way his his developing ability to talk to people uh, at, at a popular level. And uh, there's a big difference in that book from the first book uh, on uh, on headlessness, you know. And, uh, and again, society was changing. The 60s were quite different from the 50s. And, and, you know, the flower power and the Beatles and interest in other religions, Eastern religions. There was an opening up. Uh, of uh, openness towards uh, a new kind of spirituality and psychology. So th there were a lot of change going on. So I think society uh, was changing and was much more open. So he, he was not holding back. Uh, you know, he was doing all he could, but it, it, it just the stars weren't quite aligned, I suppose. In On Having No Head, he talks about after having the experience, as you say, not being able to find other ways of thinking that were really compatible with what he was experiencing. But he ultimately comes across uh, Zen, and it's an interesting passage of the book because usually what happens with the religion is the, the teachings are given to that person and then they sort of accept them or not. But he came to the religion with his own way of thinking and yeah, then so saw Yeah, and then yeah. he saw that the the Zen ideas were were quite conducive to the way that he was seeing the world. Um, yes, I, I think the thing was that in a way he found people who were speaking his language. They were talking about their original face, you know, what does your face look like? And for your parents were born, well, that's seeing your no faces. And they were talking quite concretely and physically. Uh, so that's what attracted Douglas to that. And he was connected. Uh, the Buddhist Society published that book. Uh, there you go, you know, Zen Buddhism. So, and he thought he was going to find people who were really open to this. Uh, it, it, it didn't really turn out that way because Buddhists are just as conditioned as anyone else, really. Uh, and later on, he did say, I mean, not that much later, he did say that um, headlessness is not Zen. And uh, he knew a lot about Zen, but he would say he wasn't an authority on Zen. Uh, uh, I mean, he taught comparative religion for, for, for a number of years. So he knew what he was talking about. But I think that uh, there came a point not too long after that book where he th he realized headlessness is its own thing and it doesn't need uh, the uh, kind of confirmation of Zen. 
it connects up with Zen, but it connects up with all the great religions. And so he kind of shook himself free of, of that. But it, it was an important meeting. And uh, he felt that he had friends there in, in the early Chinese Zen masters or Chan guys, you know, who were speaking his language. So it's very encouraging. It, it, I think it makes a big difference if you've been on your own a long time to, f to find others who were talking about it, you know, because everyone around you is saying you're mad and, and, and they're not supporting you. And they're in some cases trying to undermine you and ridicule you. Uh, uh, and you, he stuck to his guns because it was true, you know, absolutely true. But it, uh, when you do come across people who are uh, saying the same thing, well, it, it, it's obviously in that kind of climate, it's very encouraging and important. But uh, you know, he he uh, he knew he was a he was a great scholar in a way, and he studied all the great mystics. Uh, he he was a real authority on. Uh, the mystics, uh, particularly the Christian ones, he was, you know, he had a particular connection with Christianity, but also, you know, with the uh, Sufi, uh, Rumi, and the the Zen people, uh, Hindu Ramana is really inspired, you know, so by Ramana Maharshi. So, uh, whenever you talk to him, it, you you realised he 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 knew them so well. Of all the traditions, they were like friends uh, to him. Whereas for me, you know, I just quote someone here and quote them there and I haven't a clue who the person is, really. But for him, <laughs> you know, for him, they, it was as if they were friends, which they were, really. Do, do you think with his, not rejection, but stepping away from Zen, was that he he didn't really felt that the, the structures of the the way of thinking were helpful to the very experiential nature of headlessness? Well, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the people in the Zen world were few and far between who would accept really his, his, his approach. You know, you've got your own thing and you stick with it. And, uh, it, and the, uh, the Zen world can be very hierarchical and, uh, it, it you know and the, the impression it's easy to get the impression uh, that uh, well if you sit for twenty years maybe maybe you'll get enlightened <laughs> maybe but don't you don't hold your breath you know uh, now that is the opposite from the headless way which is look you've got it now now live from it you know you get the goods now and now you live from it and so you could say the headless way is a threat to these hierarchical systems with usually a guy at the top uh, and a, a business structure. And uh, you, the headless way is a bit of a threat to that, you know. Uh, I, I was, uh, someone was saying, you know, the classic guru thing is the guru and the disciples, you know, and the guru's got it and you don't, and you go and listen to the guru. Now, if you uh, say that, oh, uh, thank you very much, guru, I've got it now, I've got it just the same as you. Well, the guru is not going to say, oh, great, brilliant, come and sit next to me on the stage. Anyone else got it? You know, uh, let, let's have a party. That's brilliant. No, you, you probably have to leave the organization and set up your own. <laughs> you know, so I am being naughty here. But, uh, <laughs> but it is, uh, you know, it, it does happen. Whereas the, the headless way is like we've all, we've all got it. You know, people say, oh, well, it can't be deep then. Well, uh, wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you see the headless way, uh, you know, it's not... You know, there are lots of ways home. Of course there are. Uh, and I'm just singing my song and, you know, standing on my soapbox here. But uh, the, the headless way is, in essence, non-hierarchical. You know, I'm sharing it with you, Jack, and we're, we've both got the same undivided space where we are. We've got different responses to it, you see. Now, that is, when you have a group of people together who are all aware of that, which we do, growing number that is dynamic 
that is creative that is exciting that's the headless way really yeah one of the theoretical issues that i had when i first started looking into it was that it's all sort of perception looking out into into the world and there's um, the capacity there to develop a very egocentric way of looking out and i suppose the thinking would be i am looking out and i am the center of the world and therefore i am the most important thing in the world why is that wrong well, because you just said, I'm the, I'm the most important thing in the world. But when you look back, there's no thing. You see, you look at me, I, I, you know, we can see each other on the screen. And I look at you, I see you're a thing, because I'm this far away from you, I see your face. I look back, I see no face here, no thing. So you could say you're the centre of the world, but not as a thing, as no thing. It's very humble. You can only be the center by being no thing, by being empty, by being out of the way. So you see uh, where your face, your ego, whatever you want to call it, is out there in the mirror, out there in others, out there at that human region, but not here at the center. And, and here at the center is the one you really, really are. And uh, it, there's an argument for saying that this is true humility, isn't it? it? It's 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 not saying I, Richard, am the most. That's ridiculous. Most important. I am the centre. Is obviously not. But what? But I, my experience is that this nothingness I, I am is the centre. You see, I look out and uh, I've got my headless body, and then there are other people further away and trees and clouds and at night the stars it's ranged around me in layers and i turn around and i don't turn around the 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 scenery moves and i close my eyes and the world disappears well I, I, it's not richard making the world disappear you see if we just do that now and the listener can try it you close your eyes well the room's disappeared and there's a darkness now, you didn't do that as a person. You open your eyes now. Well, my experience is the world reappears in the nothingness. Now, this is as it is given, and it, it's saying, oh, okay, this, this is who I am, this extraordinary nothing. So I think that's it. Uh, the thing is that one has to keep looking uh, you know, one can get all kinds of ideas about what this is. And then really, the next thing to do is just have another look and, and even point and say, well, what am I now? Let's not go by what I've just theorized. You know, all right, what am I now? What am I looking out of now? So it's absolutely available. The listener now, you point back, you see. Uh, or we could just do a little closed eye thing, Jack, for the listener, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, all right. So, uh, well, uh, there's a couple of things I like to do first and then lead into it, which is just notice that the field of view that you're looking at fades out all the way around. It's sort of oval, but you can't see anything above it or to the left or the right or below it. It's just sort of hanging there in consciousness, in space. And I can't say how big it is, you know, how wide it is, because... Uh, you know, if you look at two objects, you can say, well, that one is wider than that one or bigger than that one. But when you look at the whole view, you, there isn't a second view, is there? It's single, right? So you yeah. can't say mine is bigger than yours. So the, that's one thing is that you can't say how big it is in terms of not being able to compare it with anything else. And it's not inside anything. If you look at any object, it's inside the environment the things all the way around it. But when you look at the whole field of view, it fades out and it's just hanging in nothing. So if you close your eyes, and the listener, uh, you know, I invite you to do this, close your eyes, uh, you, the room's disappeared and there's a darkness. Now, I can't say how big the darkness is because there isn't a second. It's just, you know, how wide is that? Wide is, you know, you, it's as wide as wide. And is it inside anything, you know, in your head? Or, well, I don't perceive it. It's hanging in nothing, like the visual field. Now, if I attend to sounds, you hear my voice 
coming and going, other sounds, and how big is the whole field of sound, you see? Well, again, it's single, and uh, I can't say it's as wide as wide. And does it fade out into, you know, is it inside your head or inside anything? No, it's in silence, in consciousness. So I say the, the my voice is coming out of this consciousness, this silence, going back into it. All the other sounds are coming out of it. The darkness is in it, see? And the sounds don't disturb the silence. They just come out of it. They're, they're no mind, the void. And if you attend to your sensations, this is a quick tour of the other senses, if you attend to your body sensations, you see, well, again, there's only one field of sensation. And you can imagine yourself six feet away looking and seeing your body and then mapping that, you know, have it holding that image. But on, just from your point of view, from my point of view, I, I don't find a, a, a body, a shape. You see, what, what shape are you? Uh, how big is this field of sensation? I mean, how big are you? You see, well, uh, there, isn't, there isn't a second field of sensation to compare yourself with. And is this sensation inside anything? Not memory, you see, not imagination. I find not. And the same with thoughts and feelings. If you think of a number... See, there's that number. Well, where did that come from? Did that come out of your head or a brain or a mind? It just comes out of nowhere, like the sound, you see. Or you think of the face of a friend and the affection you you feel as a feeling. Well, where did that come from? Where Where does it happen? Isn't it in this no mind, like the darkness and the sounds and the sensations? See, so with eyes closed, uh, how big are you? Well, I can't say. See, how old are you? It's very simple. The first person is single, first person singular, and uh, I say I, no boundary. Everything is in me: the sounds, sensations in this consciousness, and this consciousness doesn't have my name on it or your name. It's it's indivisible and uh, doesn't belong to anyone. So you see, now we move from vision to non non vision, and uh, nothing really changes. I mean, who you really are doesn't get smaller or bigger, or you know. And this is just being aware of that underlying, unchanging being in which all these changing things are happening. See. Now, how available is that? And how simple? And it's not a matter of fe feelings come up in it. See, so now open your eyes and the space is filled with colors and shapes as well as sensations and sounds. And have you suddenly shrunk into a body? Well, my arms and my, I look down, my body comes out of nowhere. You see, and I'm looking out of nowhere and I'm speaking from nowhere. And people say, oh, well, how can you function like that? You know, well, you've always been functioning like this. You're just noticing it. It doesn't mean you have to now forget about your head uh, or your appearance. But you're seeing it, that's not where you're operating from. You're operating from this vastness. Now, it makes a difference to be conscious that you're operating from this vastness, that you are this vastness. Try it, find out, you see. It really makes a difference, and it's enjoyable. It's, a, it's an interesting experiment to do, especially reopening your eyes, mm. and then the vision sort of floods back, back in, but you realise it's not flooding back into anything. It right. just rem remains... Out yes. there. <laughs> well, there you are, you see. And that's one of the joys of sharing it, because you've just expressed that in a way different from the way I described it. And that is uh, refreshing and interesting. And everyone has their own response, you see. And the listener will be having their own response. And that's why it's so interesting to to share it and to, to uh, 
uh, find out other people's different different responses to it. Yeah. Yeah. The the one thing that it does have in common with um, Zen is that um, that great void aspect or the, the void that um, that is where your head used to be. Um, and and Douglas sort of sort of talks about that in the um, in the book on having no head. Um, but that seems to be uh, an experience or a realization that you get after practicing having no head. Well, you see, you can't do it wrong. You can't half see your no head or see it a bit blurry. I mean, you you, you the no head is indivisible and clear, perfectly clear. So you're doing it perfectly from the start. But your realizations and what it means to you will be different from what it means to someone else. And and uh, this is for celebrating this difference. And you don't have to manipulate your realizations or reactions to fit into what you think they should be or someone else's, you know. Uh, you you gradually, I suppose, relax and say, "Oh, this is my response," and it, and that's totally valid. You see, and it's different from yours, and there isn't a right way of responding. Uh, so uh, you've got it from the start. You've got it. Uh, just keep enjoying it. Keep bringing your attention to this. See, I mean, when you're lying in bed, if you can't get to sleep. Just become aware of this single consciousness, this darkness and sensations uh, floating, uh, you know, in this vast, it's very relaxing, really, in this vastness. The, the last thing that I sort of noticed about the practice um, when I was doing my, my research was that there's no real normative way for how you live your life or moral precepts that are entwined into the way of thinking but you were talking before about when seeing the face of another person and your no face um, yes. you you almost gain an empathy for that person and then the old golden rule pops up that you wouldn't do to that person what you wouldn't have them yes. do to you and so it does have a um, yeah. a moral and a normative framework in which you can then go out and live your life in what would typically be called a a moral or ethical way. Well, there you are. You see, you, you've just uh, worked that out in your own way, which is great. I like the way you, you put it there. Uh, when you see that you have no face, uh, the, you have the other person's face, so you wouldn't want to do to you know, as you say, don't do to others that what you don't want them to do to you. Well, you're realizing that is you there in a way you could say, and there's nothing in the way it hurts another is to hurt yourself. This is, it isn't another set of rules, it, it, but it is a very, you know, more than deep connection with others. It's a recognition that you see, I, I'm really not in this Skype meeting. This me Skype meeting is in me, right? I mean, uh, from the outside, I'm in the Skype meeting. If someone came in the room, then they'd see me as a person. But from the inside, I'm space for the Skype meeting. I'm space for you. I'm not in the world. The world is in me. Now, the world is in me. The world is me. I'm space. You know, now, that, that changes everything, doesn't it? And uh, to start to live from that is to challenge very deep assumptions about who others are and who you are and how to behave. But, but uh, it, it, it's not as though you then throw out the, the conventional rules. You still accept you are a person and you need to recognize and follow all of that. But inwardly, in a way, it's 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 more demanding. <laughs> yeah, because you're so involved with everything now. Yes. You almost pay so much more attention and, and really ensure that um, there there is no harm done to... Well, yes, to... And, 
growing up, you learn to be responsible for yourself. You learn to see yourself as others see you and be responsible for that. So you say, well, these are my actions. These are my words. You know, th this is my property. You, you take responsibility for that bit of the world. Then you wake up to who you really are and you realize you're the whole shooting match. So, uh, uh, and you're in a certain sense, in a certain sense, you're responsible for the whole lot. I think they say uh, one reason, perhaps, why people say, oh, seeing who you are, yeah, no, I did that, no, it's not for me. Uh, I, I think one reason could be that they have a, a, a recognition that it is very demanding and it means being responsible for everything. I mean, at one level, you're responsible for nothing. You're free, you're empty, you, you know. But on another level, it's all you, uh, you know. I mean, Jesus... Uh, he was talking about the same thing, and he got crucified, right? I mean, you know, it, it's not um, a way out. It's a, it's a way in. It's uh, taking responsibility. It's involvement. It's love of the world, not uh, kind of washing your hands of it. Yeah, which is one of the more standard criticisms that are really thrown against Zen and those sort of ways of teaching that they prescribe to that complete nothingness way of thinking and the easy reaction is to say well you're just you know, washed of, of all moral responsibility and only really pursuing your own enlightenment but yes but it's a that, misconception it's a misconception because you your own enlightenment turns out to be the enlightenment of the world you know who is getting enlightened who is seeing who you are it's not richard I, it's not Richard seeing who I am. It's the one within me seeing who I am, which is the world. You can't see who you are separate from the world. Seeing who you are is seeing you are the world. Uh, so to, uh, I think that criticism is by people who are not living it. Uh, you, you know, they, they, they may have seen it and then jumped into the idea, oh, it's just nothing, it's just opting out. Well, it's not. It's the opposite. It, 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 to become the nothing is to become the all, is to... Uh, be deeply involved in the world. I mean, more deeply than you can imagine to be the world uh, and your heart goes out to it. And uh, th this is, uh, you know, uh, the opposite of uh, dropping out. It's dropping in, really. And then you're quite into the um, really theological idea of non-duality with you just being a, a part of a part of everything. But the thing about the headless way is essentially it's non-verbal. And so you don't get hooked on any of these ideas, whether they're the non-dual or the whatever. Uh, those are interesting ideas, but they come up in the space. And the experience itself is non-verbal. And so this is very freeing. So you don't get into, oh, now I know the truth in words. You be it non-verbally and then see what comes out. And that goes back to Douglas Harding's experience of having the, the headless viewpoint and then coming across teachings that sort of represented what he was yeah, saying. that's right. And, and then he found it, it in all the traditions. And uh, so uh, this is a deep thing, a very traditional thing. It's a new, new way in to, to really what uh, a very traditional, deep, experience in uh, human nature you know but this is making it popular not shallow popular yeah and so for someone that is spiritually seeking um would your advice then be to to drop the theology books and just have a good look at, at what they can see and what they can what they can perceive well i, I don't think you have to drop anything I, I, to see who you are uh, I, I think, yes, do the experiments, and they're on the website and uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, and uh, do the experiments and see that you can see who you are now. I mean, do it now. Look for your face, you see. You don't have to drop anything. But then see, uh, I mean, one common reaction when people see who they are, see they're headless, is they go back to their theology books or their scriptures or their, you know, spiritual books, and now they can understand them, you know, like easy. That is a common reaction. Uh, uh, or, the, you know, a rather funny way of saying it is that 
in the past, you used to read the books to see if you were right. Now you read the books to see if they are right. <laughs> now, that is a shift in center, isn't it? That's a shift in authority. You become the authority on you. I'm not an authority on Christian mysticism or theology, but I'm an authority on me, on what it's like to be me, just as you are an authority on you, Jack. And this is the headless way saying you are the authority on you. Don't abrogate that. Don't give it away. And how do you find out who you are? Well, you have to pay attention, not just to what you're looking at, but the place you're looking out of, which is what the experiments are doing. They're all directing your attention 180 degrees back or the place you're looking out of and literally point at it, you know, uh, move your hands back into the great void. Uh, see you're looking out of a single eye. So you don't have to drop anything. You know, you, you might drop it afterwards when you realize perhaps you don't need it in the same way, but you might not. Uh, that, that's up to you. Yeah, and so Richard, you've been talking that you conduct um, meetings online that people join where they still sort of have these, these discussions similar to the ones that you had early on at Douglas Harding's place. Are those meetings quite accessible and, and how? Oh, yeah, we, we have uh, five, six, seven Zoom meetings, online Zoom meetings a week, and they're free. And uh, to f get information on them, just email me. You can get that by the website. Um, so if people are interested in joining those and there's no cost and there's no commitment, you just drop in. As long as you've done the experiments, I would say. Just get in touch with me, email me, um, and I will give you information on that. But there's lots on the website as well and our YouTube channel. And, you know, we're, I don't go around making students. I hopefully go around making friends uh, of people who are, uh, you know, interested in living from this. And uh, so uh, we have a really warm, open, friendly online community I think, and uh, so do feel welcome. Yeah. Well, Richard, fantastic. I think that's been a very comprehensive conversation. Uh, How good. I How hope... good. As the Beatles said, uh, on the rooftop, we let it be. So have I passed the audition? <laughs> 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 yeah, we might have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, great to talk with you, Jack, and thank you for inviting me. And... Uh, uh, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. But thank you very much. A delight to share with you.